Texas, the man you believe killed President Kennedy. I think we have the right man. He was cuffed, fingerprinted, booked for murder. Does he confess anything? No. Come on, man. The president. But before he could be tried. I don't know what this is all about. Before he was found innocent or proven guilty. The Oswald has been tried. He was silenced forever. The world may never know the truth about the crime of the century. Now his case goes to court. Is he innocent or guilty? A&E presents The Trial of the Harvey Oswald. Hello, I'm Bill Curtis. In recent months, the tragic figure of Lee Harvey Oswald has once again emerged at the center of a nationwide debate. Was he the lone assassin of President Kennedy or a patsy for a bizarre conspiracy? One thing is for sure, he never got to tell his story, never got his day in court. Now, to a great extent, that's about to change. What you are about to see is real. The witnesses are who they say they are. The judge, the lawyers are all courtroom veterans of criminal law. And the jury is made up of peers charged with reaching a verdict. The question before the court, did Lee Harvey Oswald kill President John F. Kennedy on November 22nd, 1963? That November morning when Dallas was to witness the most notorious murder in modern American history, President Kennedy had an unusually warm welcome. As the motorcade entered Dealey Plaza, Nellie Connolly, wife of the governor of Texas, turned to the president and said, Mr. Kennedy, you can't say Dallas doesn't love you. Moments later, the youngest president in American history was gunned down. He was rushed to nearby Parkland Hospital. 30 minutes later came the announcement the President of the United States is dead. A wave of shock and grief swept much of the world. In a few seconds, the man many believed to be the best hope of his generation was gone. All the shots were fired from the sixth floor of this building on the corner, the Texas School Book Depository. That is according to the official inquiry. Many eyewitnesses were convinced the fatal shots came from this area, in front and to the right of the motorcade, known as the Grassy Knoll. That same day, an employee of the school book depository, Lee Harvey Oswald, was arrested following the killing of police patrolman J.D. Tippett. Later, at the Dallas Police Department, he was also charged with the assassination of the president. Oswald was a former Marine and defector to the Soviet Union. When he returned to the United States with a Russian wife, he publicly professed support for Fidel Castro. We advocate restoration of diplomatic, trade, and tourist relations with Cuba. There is Lee Oswald. He's been shot. He's been shot. Within 48 hours of Kennedy's death, Oswald was himself dead. Shot in the basement of the Dallas Police Department by Jack Ruby, a local nightclub owner. The Warren Commission headed by Chief Justice Earl Warren, was appointed by the new President Lyndon Johnson to investigate the assassination. It concluded that Oswald and Oswald alone shot the President. There was no conspiracy. But doubts remain, and in the mid-1970s, a new investigation by a House of Representatives Select Committee reached a more ambiguous conclusion. Oswald was guilty, but there was a high probability of another gunman in Dealey Plaza. It was from the now famous Grassy Knoll that a Dallas citizen, Abraham Zapruder, inadvertently filmed the assassination. A terrible image of the president's death was preserved for posterity. Zapruder's film, now enhanced by computer, also offers tantalizing clues about the source of the fatal shots. And what of Lee Harvey Oswald? He claimed to be innocent, a fall guy, to use his own words, just a patsy. In the eyes of the American government, he is condemned as President Kennedy's killer. Yet in his own violent death, Oswald was denied the fundamental right of every American, the right to legal representation and a fair trial. At the same time, the American people were denied the right to see justice done in the crime of the century. The trial you are about to see will be as close as possible to a real trial. There is no script. There has been no rehearsal. The judge is a real judge, the lawyers are lawyers, and the witnesses are all genuine. No actor will be playing Lee Harvey Oswald. The defendant's chair is empty. 
Prosecuting Lee Harvey Oswald is Vincent Bugliosi of Los Angeles. Mr. Bugliosi achieved national prominence when he successfully prosecuted mass murderer Charles Manson. Lee Harvey Oswald's defense counsel is Jerry Spence of Jackson, Wyoming. Mr. Spence did not lose a case before a jury for 17 years. He became nationally prominent when he won $10 million for the family of nuclear worker Karen Silkwood. The jury is made up of citizens of Dallas, Texas, drawn from the official court rules. Presiding is Judge Lucius Button of the Western District of Texas. Judge Button is a former Texas district attorney. This cast of distinguished characters will deal with many of the important issues that have surrounded the Kennedy assassination for years. The same rules and procedures which cover any criminal trial will be followed in this trial. And so we'll begin the trial of Lee Harvey Oswald with opening arguments to the jury from both sides and then the witnesses when we return on A&E. &E. The United States of America versus Lee Harvey Oswald. Prosecution ready? Yes, Your Honor. Defendant ready? Defendant's ready, Your Honor. All right. Let me explain just uh, a little bit about how we'll proceed uh, during the course of this uh, proceeding. First, we'll have opening statements, uh, first by the government, since the burden is on the United States government to prove guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. Since they have that burden, they have the opportunity to go first uh, with an opening statement. Then an opening statement will be made by Mr. Spence. Uh, these opening statements are not evidence. Evidence you're going to get from the witness stand or from exhibits that come in during the course of the trial uh, or from stipulations. That's why the attorneys agree uh, that something uh, is a fact. That's the evidence. And it's from those facts, that evidence, that you will determine whether the defendant is guilty uh, or not guilty. Mr. Bugliosi, you may proceed, sir. Mr. Spence, Judge Button, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I don't have to tell you that you've been called upon to sit as the jury on perhaps the most important murder case ever tried in this country. In any political assassination, ladies and gentlemen, almost as inevitably as death and taxes, there is always a chorus of critics screaming the word conspiracy before the fatal bullet has even come to rest. The evidence that will be presented at this trial will show that there is no substance to the persistent charge by these critics that Lee Harvey Oswald was just a patsy set up to take the fall by some uh, elaborate conspiracy. We expect the evidence, all of the evidence, to show that Lee Harvey Oswald, acting alone, was responsible for the assassination of John F. Kennedy. We expect the defense, in an anemic effort to deflect suspicion away from Mr. Oswald, to offer theories, speculation, conjecture, but not one speck of credible evidence that any other person or group murdered President Kennedy and framed Lee Harvey Oswald for the murder that they committed. As this trial unfolds, you will see how utterly preposterous the allegation of a frame-up is. The evidence of this trial will produce a, a, a vivid and a rather stark psychological portrait of Oswald as a deeply disturbed and maladjusted man it will show him to be a fanatical Marxist who restlessly searched for a country to embody the Marxist dream. The evidence will show that on the morning of the assassination, November the 22nd, 1963, Oswald carried his weapon, a 6.5 millimeter Mannlicher Carcano rifle, into his place of employment at the Texas School Book Depository Building. The presidential motorcade was scheduled to pass right in front of that building that very noon. At 12.30 p.m., as the president's limousine drove slowly by, three shots rang out from the southeasternmost window on the sixth floor of that building, one of which penetrated President Kennedy's upper right back, exited the front of his throat, another entering the right rear of his head and exiting and shattering the right frontal area of his head. As the presidential limousine screeched away to Parkland Memorial Hospital, where he was pronounced dead. The president, his lifeblood gushing from his body, 
lay mortally wounded in his mm -hmm. wife Jacqueline's lap. Within minutes of the assassination, Oswald's rifle was found on the same sixth floor, the floor from which Oswald had brutally cut down at the age of only 46, the 35th president of these United States. The evidence will show that Oswald's rifle, to the exclusion of all other weapons, was determined by firearms experts to be the rifle that fired the two bullets that struck down President Kennedy. The evidence will further show that just 45 minutes after the assassination, Oswald, in frantic flight from what he had just done, shot and killed Dallas police officer J.D. Tippett, running from the scene of the murder to a theater where he was arrested and subdued after drawing his revolver on one of the arresting officers. Much more evidence, ladies and gentlemen, much more will be produced at this trial, irresistibly connecting Oswald and no other person or group to the assassination. I have every confidence that after you folks fairly and objectively evaluate all of the evidence in this case, you will find that Lee Harvey Oswald, and Lee Harvey Oswald alone, was responsible for the assassination of President John F. Kennedy. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Mr. Williosi. Mr. Spence? Thank you, Your Honor. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. For 20 years now, we have all been told that my client, Lee Harvey Oswald, killed our beloved president. And Mr. Bugliosi knows that that's what you think, that that's what we think, that that's what even I thought when I began the preparation of the defense of this case. And so I want to take a little more time than he to evaluate the history that's occurred over all of these years to determine whether or not, in fact, you haven't been carrying with you a national lie and whether or not in this case you don't want to undo by your verdict a national lie now one thing folks that we know uh, is that uh, you've watched him do it already You've watched him walk up here and, and tell you that Lee was a commie, and we hate commies. And he's told you that Lee um, was a madman, and we hate madmen. And so what he has done is, is to look at you and say, this isn't a fair jury at all. This is a jury full of prejudice and hatred and passion that I can work with and work on. And so I will make this jury hate Lee Harvey Oswald before he ever had a trial. You understand, of course, in this case that my client, Lee Harvey Oswald, never had an opportunity to come before you and to speak to you and to look at you and to have you look at him. My client, Lee Harvey Oswald, was slain by a, an assassin's bullet. He was silenced so that he could never tell you the truth. And now it's my job somehow to try to find some way to bring some parts of the truth to you. Not all of the truth, because as we discover before this case is over, the truth in this case has been concealed from us. It's like there is a closet over here, and the closet door is locked, and we don't know what's in the closet door. And they say to us, tell us, in your defense of Leo Harvey Oswald, what is in the closet? And I say, open up the closet door so we can, so we can give it to the jury, and you will find that when this case is concluded, the door will still be locked. Now, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, we're going to find out in this assassination 
We're going to find in this assassination that the key information that we need for making any kind of, of decision is gone. You heard Mr. Mr. Bugliosi come up and tell you where the shots were fired from. That's in dispute. There's hardly anybody in the country that doesn't dispute it. We'll find out that there is only one way, ladies and gentlemen, that you can ever determine where the bullet came from. Did it come from back or the front? Mr. Bugliosi wants to make sure that it came from the back, because if it came from the back, he can claim that it was Lee. But if there is evidence that it came from the front, it was somebody else. When this case is over, ladies and gentlemen, you'll go back to the jury room, and there will be one verdict, unfortunately that you can return and that is a verdict that says we don't know we just don't know we wish we did know we wish the closet door were unlocked and because we don't know because they won't unlock the closet because they have been unfair because they have secreted and hidden the truth from us We have only one, one choice. And that's to say that the government still, after 20 years, has refused to come forward with the facts in this sad case about our great president. And that you, therefore, as honest jurors, must return a verdict of not guilty. Thank you very much. The trial of Lee Harvey Oswald will continue in a moment here on A&E. The trial of Lee Harvey Oswald brings together two distinguished lawyers, arguing a question that has been debated for years. Did Lee Harvey Oswald kill President Kennedy? The attorneys are calling actual witnesses before a jury made up of citizens from Dallas, Texas. The rules are the same as the rules in any criminal trial. There are no actors here. There are no scripts. And at the end of the trial, the jury will decide on a verdict. Was Lee Harvey Oswald guilty or not guilty of killing the President of the United States? Mr. Bugliosi, call your first witness. <clears throat> Government calls you Mule Frazier. If you, if you come forward, raise your right hand, please. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you will give in the proceedings before this court will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you, God? I do. Thank Take you. seat and witness stand, please. Be seated. Mr. Frazier, do you reside here in Dallas? Yes. Directing your attention way back to October of 1963, where you employed at the Texas School Book Depository Building located at the corner of Elm and Houston Streets in Dallas. Yes, sir. What type of work did you do there? Order filler. Order filler of books? Yes, sir. In mid-October of that year, 1963, did a man named Lee Harvey Oswald start to work at the Book Depository Building? Yes, sir. And did you learn that Mr. Oswald's Russian-born wife, Marina, was living with a lady named Ruth Payne about half a block from where you lived at 2515 West 5th Street? Yes, sir. Did you learn from Mr. Oswald that he was living by himself in Dallas? Yes, sir, I did. At the beginning of Mr. Oswald's employment at the Book Depository Building in mid-October of 1963, did he ask you if you would drive him to his wife's home in Irving on Friday evenings after work and return with you on Monday mornings? Uh, yes, sir, he did. And you agreed to do this? Yes. Driving to and from work, would you and Mr. Oswald talk a lot? Uh, no, sir, uh, he didn't talk very much. What about at work? Would you see him talk to fellow workers, or would he be pretty, pretty much to himself? Uh, he stayed pretty much to himself. He was a loner. Okay. Now, Mr. Frazier, was there one time that Mr. Oswald asked you to drive him back to Irving that was not on a Friday? Uh, yes, sir, he did. Was that on November the 21st, 1963, a Thursday? Yes, sir. The day before President Kennedy was assassinated? Yes, sir. And what did you say to him? Uh, he asked me, could he ride home? And I said, sure, you can ride home with me anytime. And then I thought, 
and I said, well, why do you want to go home with me tonight? And uh, he told me that he was uh, going home to uh, get some curtain rods for his apartment from Miss Payne. Okay, so that evening after work, you brought Mr. Oswald back to Irving, is that correct? That's correct. The following morning, Friday, November the 22nd, 1963, did anything unusual happen while you were eating breakfast? Uh, yes, sir, it did. Uh, Lee looked, uh, had come down to my home, and he looked in the uh, kitchen window. Okay, he hadn't done that before? No, sir. Eventually, you and he got into your car? Yes, sir. When you got into the car, did you notice that he'd put something in the back seat? Uh, yes, sir. As I was getting in the car, I noticed a package on the uh, back seat. Did you ask him what it was, and if so, what did he say? Uh, yes, sir, I did ask him, and he says, you know, that's the curtain rods that I was going to pick up from Miss Payne. Okay. Once you arrived at the book depository building that morning, where did you park your car? Uh, in the employee parking lot. As I understand it, when the two of you got out of the car, he started walking ahead of you to the entrance of the building. Is that correct? That is correct. As he was walking ahead of you, was he carrying the bag that had been on the back seat? Yes, sir. Did you recall how he was carrying the bag? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, he was carrying it uh, parallel to his body. Okay, so he carried the bag right next to his body on the, uh, on the right side? Yes, sir, on the right okay. side. Was it cupped in his hand and under his armpit? I think you've said that in the, in the past. Yes, sir. Mr. Frazier, is it true that you paid hardly any attention to this bag? That is true. So the bag could have been protruding out in front of his body and you wouldn't have been able to see it. Is that correct? That is true. Mr. Frazier, I understand you watched the presidential motorcade from outside the front door of the book depository building. Is that correct? Yes, sir. And you heard the rifle shots? Yes, sir. How many did you hear? Three. After the shooting that afternoon, was there a roll call of employees to see if all the employees had returned to the building? Yes, sir, there was. Were all employees present at the time of the roll call, or was anyone missing? Uh, everyone was uh, present except Mr. Oswald. He was the only employee who was missing, is that correct? That's correct. Thank you, Mr. Frazier. No further questions. Mr. Stanch? <coughs> well, Mr. Frazier, do you feel like you've just been at the racetrack? Well, sometimes, you know, you, you can be there and, you know, it's an <laughs> enjoyable experience. So we take our time and see if we can get some facts out here. You and I have never talked together, have we? No, sir. It's the first time you and I have ever met, isn't it? That's correct. You've gone over your testimony in some detail with Mr. Um, uh, Bugliosi? I've talked with Mr. Uh, Pelosi a couple of times, but uh, not in any in-depth. Mr. Spence, I know. Just a minute. Mr. If you're Spence. going to make any address anywhere, Mr. Bugliosi, you'll stand on your okay. feet. Okay, uh, Mr. Spence, Most my Spence. name is pronounced Bugliosi. The G is silent. I've told you this several times. Though. Only... I know it's difficult, but uh, I try to do it, okay? That's the only thing that's silent Italian about Mr. Bugliosi, Your Honor. Please. Is the jury will disregard that sidebar remark for any purpose at all. Well, all right. Now, you, you, you were trying, the FBI tried to get you to admit that this package that he was carrying was longer than the package you saw. Isn't that right? Well, I, they now, had isn't me... Isn't that right, sir? Let him finish his answer, please, counsel. Yes, sir. Well, they had me to make an imaginary bag in my mind. Now, as I stated no, previously... just a minute. The Let question. him finish his answer, please. I understand. As I stated previously, I only glanced at the package because... The man, he never lied to me, so therefore I never didn't have any doubt to believe what he said was in the package. And you believe that the bag that you saw that he was carrying was one that he could put under his arm and carry in his palm. Isn't that true? Yes, sir, that's true. And, you, and, and that's longer than the rifle would be if it was broken down. Isn't that right? That's correct. Now, you didn't think that Lee was a madman, did you? No, sir, he didn't give me that impression. He seemed to you to be a kind of a nice fella, didn't he? Yes, sir. He was an uh, individual that was nice to children. And he liked his children? Yes, sir, he did. He and when he talked about his children, I think you said that he chuckled. Yes, he did. And, uh, and he, was, uh, he was concerned about his family and his wife, wasn't he, sir? Yes, he was. And you liked him, didn't you? Yes, sir. I thought he was a very nice person. He always treated me nice. Now, you heard some shots, didn't you? Yes, sir, I did. And you thought that uh, those shots came from the direction of the railroad, didn't you? Yes, sir, the no there. Now, let's get this kind of figured out, you and me, for the jury. Now, here's the Texas School Book Depository right here, isn't it? Yes, sir, that's correct. And, and you thought the shots came from another direction, didn't you, sir? 
I thought they came from the knoll over here. Well, let's could you let's just get down here. If you could just step down a minute and let's take this marker and put an X where you think the pictures were or the shot were. Okay. As you can see, as we already said, this is Texas School Book Depository, which is at Houston and Elm Street. And a little side street here that ran down here and it was a dead end. Well, right down in this area here was a knoll, as they call it there. A grassy knoll. Yes. Just write grassy knoll. Okay. Okay, and just put an, and just put an X from the, where you thought the shots were coming from. Okay. You just did that, thank you. And let's, I don't know what exhibit number this is, but we'll take care of that with the court's counsel's permission a little later. Um, would you just write your name up there, Mr. Frazier? Okay. So we know it was you that put it there. Thank you for your help and your assistance. That's all the questions I have, sir. Mr. Frazier, if you would, please, if you'd step down. Thank you. Thank you. Bugliosi, if you would, please, call your next witness. Government calls Harold Norman. Mr. Norman. Yes, sir. If you would, please, if you'd come forward. <clears throat> and I believe you were sworn earlier as a witness, were you not? Yes, sir. Just have a seat right up there, please. <clears throat> Tell us your name. Harold Norman. Where do you live, Mr. Norman? Dallas, Texas. Thank you. Mr. Norman, uh, in November of 1963, were you working as an order filler for yes. school books uh, at the Texas School Book Depository Building? Yes, sir. And one of your co-workers was Lee Harvey Oswald, is that correct, sir? Yes, sir. Did you become acquainted or friendly with Mr. Oswald at work, Mr. Norman? No, sir. Is there a reason for that? I didn't, he didn't have any, we didn't have any conversations at all, so I... He was kind of a loner? Loner. On Friday morning, November the 22nd, 1963, the day President Kennedy was assassinated, did you see the presidential motorcade that day? Yes, sir. Where did you watch it from? From the uh, fifth floor. Did you watch the motorcade with any co-workers? Yes, sir. And what are their names? James Jorman, which is known as Junior, and Monterey William. Exhibit D. Mr. Norman, on your left is a photograph of four windows, three of which are open. And as you can see, there are two men in the bottom windows. Do you recognize who is shown in this photograph? Yes, sir. And who is shown? This is uh, Bonnie Ray Williams, and that is myself, Harold Norman. So you were in the southeasternmost window of the fifth floor of the book depository building? Yes, sir. And then eventually the presidential motorcade passed by, is that correct? Yes, sir. What did you see and hear at that time, Mr. Norman? Well, I heard a shot when the... Uh, motorcade came by. The first shot to like the president slump. Then I heard two more shots. So you heard a total of three shots? Yes, sir. Did it sound to you like a rifle was being fired directly above you? Yes, sir. Was there any other reason, in addition to the sound of the rifle, any other reason why you believe the shots were coming from directly above you? Yes, sir. What is that? Because I could hear the uh, empty hulls, that's what I call them, hit the floor and I could hear the uh, bolt action of the rifle being pushed back and forward. You're familiar with a bolt action rifle? Yes, sir. Now by halls you mean uh, cartridge cases? Cartridge. How many did you hear falling to the floor? Three. Is the sound of that bolt action and the ejection of the cartridge casings and they're falling to the floor something that you're going to remember for the rest of your life? Yes, sir. Good. Could Incidentally... We, just excuse me, just, Your Honor, I haven't really made any objection about leading questions because I generally don't do that in a trial, but it would be nice if counsel wouldn't lead him, particularly like the last one, giving him, um, uh, leading him into posterity, even, e even into eternity. I'm going to overrule the objection at this time. One more question. At any time in the morning of the assassination, did you see any stranger or strangers in the book depository building? No, sir. No further questions. Thank you, Mr. Norman. Mr. Spence, you may proceed, sir. Well, Mr. Norman... <clears throat> Give us the, the rhythm of the sounds of these shots. Was it bam, 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 or what was it? As I recall, the rhythm of the sounds of shots were boom, click, click, boom, click, click, boom, click, click. 
Just all even. Yes, sir. Even. Now, you, you said that you heard uh, uh, some hulls drop. Yes, sir. If it, after it was all over, somebody had come around and said we found uh, three nails, big nails, or three big screws, or something of that nature, the sounds that you heard would have, of, of the things hitting the floor, would have been consistent, would have sounded like about anything metal dropping. Isn't that true? I can't say. I mean, had you ever heard... You never had heard metal cases from a from a gun drop over your head before, had you? I told you what it sounded like to me. Yeah. Yes, sir. You thought there was an armed man upstairs, right? I thought there was a man upstairs. Well, you must have figured he was armed because you were hearing shooting and shells falling all over the place. Isn't that true? I heard three, sir. So he, let's see if we can start again. You thought there was an armed man up there, isn't that right? I can't say that. Thought... Didn't you think there was somebody up there I with a gun? I thought there was somebody up there, sir. With a gun, all right. You didn't run and get the hell out of there? No, sir. You never did call down for the police? <laughs> no, sir. You stayed up there for 15 minutes just watching the crowd after that, isn't that true? I can't say exactly what time it was, sir. You stayed up there for quite some time watching the crowd afterwards, isn't that true, sir? I stayed up for a while. Yes. And uh, you left about 2 o'clock? Yes, sir. So everybody was absent, isn't that true? Uh, after, we, after they let us go home, everyone was absent. After. Everybody finally left the building. With the uh, permission of the officers? Yes. That would include my client, Mr. Oswald, isn't that I true? I don't know, sir. He wasn't there either, was he? I never did see him anymore, sir. Yes. Thanks. Yes, sir. Appreciate it. The trial of Lee Harvey Oswald will continue in a moment. You're on A&E. We now return to the trial of Lee Harvey Oswald. Tell us your name. Eugene Boone. Where you live, Mr. Boone? Abilene, Texas. In 1963, Mr. Boone, were you a deputy sheriff of the county of Dallas? Yes, sir, I was. And at approximately 12.30 p.m. on the date, November the 22nd, 1963, the day of the assassination, do you recall where you were? Yes, sir. And where was that? In front of the sheriff's office at 505 Main Street. Did you hear any shots around that time? Yes, sir, I did. Uh, would you please show the jury where you were at the time you heard the shots, where you ran to, and uh, what you did when you arrived at that area? Generally, I was in this area right here. I ran down Main Street and around this cement works across this grassy area here and then eventually over this uh, the fence and the cement wall embutment here into the freight yards. This is the famous grassy knoll area right here? Yes sir. Can the jury see this? There we go. Did you find any evidence at all uh, of a gunman having been in that area right there. No, sir. We're talking about the grassy knoll area and the uh, the railroad yard area behind the grassy knoll area. No, sir. As I recall, there were uh, cars parked in this area right here. This area here, there was a flower bed uh, in the in this area here. I did examine the flower bed and the foliage uh, in this area and down this area here, and could see no footprints in the flower beds that had recently been turned. Or was there any indication of any powder burns, anything like that, on any of the foliage that we could see? Okay, you may resume the witness stand. After you searched the area about which you've just been testifying to, Mr. Boone, I understand you went to the sixth floor of the Book Depository Building and searched that floor with other law enforcement officers. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Exhibit number 11. Now on the screen is a photograph Mr. Boone, of stacks of cartons or boxes near a window, do you recognize what is depicted in uh, this photograph? The boxes on the inside of the southeast building, uh, southeast uh, floor of the sixth floor of the school book depository, the southeast corner. When you arrived on the sixth floor, is this the way the cartons were stacked around that window? Yes, sir. So there, you could almost say there was a sniper's nest around that window? Yes, sir. 
How long after the, uh, the shots that you heard did you arrive? Excuse that... me. But it seems to me, Your Honor, that uh, this man has been leading all morning, over and over again, even to the point that he had one witness led into what he would remember forever. And I object to that. Now, I just want the record to show that I object to that. And if you want me not to make any further objections on that kind, I'd like the record to reveal that you've instructed me not to do that, not to make any more such objections, Spence, and I'll not make any. But I want you to know that I do object to the continuous leading questions of counsel. Mr. Spence, keep on your feet, Mr. Spence, if you would, please. Yes, sir. Mr. Spence, my ruling is you can make any objection that you want to. Don't ever tell the court that you're just standing up and you know that it is a waste of time because you don't get any of them. I don't just decide, except on the basis of the law as I feel it is, whether your objection is good or whether it's bad. As to what it looked like, I sustained as to what it looked like. You can make your description on that part only. Thank you, sir. You may be seated. Now, may I have a ruling on my objection, please? Yes, sir. I sustained as to what it looked like, as to the sniper's bit. May I have a, may I have a ruling on whether or not it was leading? It was leading. Thank yes, you, Your Honor. Sir. Thank you. You may proceed, Mr. Williams. What do those cartons and boxes look like to you? It looked like an attempt to hide something on the other side. If someone had been walking on that sixth floor and someone was behind those boxes, uh, could the person behind the boxes have been seen? They would be concealed from either the elevator or the stairwell across the building. Exhibit 12. Next on the screen is another photograph. Do you recognize what is depicted in this photograph? Yes, sir. It's the area between the row of boxes on the previous exhibit and the window. Looks like a, a place where a rifle could rest. Those boxes look like a gun rest? Yes, sir, as I remember them. Did you eventually spot a rifle on the sixth floor, Mr. Boone? Yes, sir, I did. Exhibit 14, do you recognize what is depicted in this photograph? Yes, sir. The rifle. The rifle that you saw on the sixth floor? Yes, sir. Is that the way the rifle looked when you found it? Yes, sir. When you first looked at the weapon, Mr. Boone, did you mistakenly take it for a 7.65 millimeter Mauser? Yes, sir. And why did you think it was a Mauser? Well, Mauser basically refers to the bolt action, and there were a lot of military weapons around at that point in time. Is Ma Mauser kind of a generic term for a bolt action rifle? Yes, sir. You are not an expert on firearms? I am not. Thank you, Mr. Boone. No further questions. Mr. Spence? Thank you. You may inquire. Well, how you doing, Mr. Boone? Very well, thank you, sir. I, uh, I want you to help me make some sense out of some of this, if you would. You were the one that found this gun, is that right? Yes, sir. I mean, not to belittle you in any way, well, you just happened to be there, but anybody could have found that gun, couldn't they? If they were looking in the right direction, yes. I mean, anybody that went up on the sixth floor looking for something would have had to been blind not to see it. Isn't that right, sir? No, sir. I mean, there it is. That's the way you saw it. Isn't that yes, true? Yes, sir. And so, do you think that that's uh, the way somebody who really was trying to hide a gun would hide a gun? Or do you think, Lieutenant, that that's where a gun would be left by somebody who wanted a gun to be found? I'm sorry? I mean, they took enough time to create a so-called sniper's den of boxes, didn't they? Yes, yeah, sir. Sure. Don't you think they would have taken sufficient time, unless they wanted the gun to be found, to find a place to hide the gun where you just couldn't walk right up and see it. For example, right in there. Well, all right. Now about the shells. You found shells up there, didn't you? Uh, Officer Luke Mooney found some cartridge Three cases. Three cartridge cases, weren't there? Yes, sir. Right out in plain sight, in front of anybody that wanted to see them, right in the so-called sniper's den. Isn't that true? Behind the boxes, yes, sir. And uh, don't you think that anybody 
Who was attempting to perform an assassination? Who would indeed set up a sniper's den? Would have taken the time to pick up three cartridges so they couldn't be connected with his rifle? Doesn't that seem reasonable? Or do you think, officer, or did you consider the possibility that the three cartridge cases were left there, like the rifle, so that they could be found? Did you give that some thought? No, sir. Sure. Could we have Exhibit 13, please? Now, Exhibit 13 shows us the so-called sniper's den, doesn't it, officer? Yes, sir. And it's the circles are around where those shell cartridges were plainly found. Isn't that true? Yes, sir. And isn't it true that a rifle of the kind involved in this case... May I, Your Honor? Are you sure it's unloaded, you may Absolutely. Proceed. I've uh, I've looked in this both directions. Thank you. Um, isn't it true, officer, that a rifle of this kind ejects the shell to the right? Yes, sir, generally. Well, generally or doesn't it always eject the shell to the right? Have you ever seen a rifle of this type eject the shell to the left? Let me see the weapon. That should eject it to the right, to the not to generally, the but right. in every case, isn't that true, officer? Yes, sir. But in the case in point, part of the shells were ejected to the right and part to the left, isn't that true? Uh, the way it appears there. Does that stand up to, in accordance with your idea about where cartridges would have naturally come from the rifle as the party shot? out the window or does it more properly match a situation where somebody threw cartridges to be found i don't know now a mauser you know is a considered to be a much better gun than a man liquor in a general sense isn't that true yes sir that is, it shoots better and it shoots faster, doesn't it? Well, it shoots better. It's more accurate weapon. And a man licker, Italian man licker, on the other hand, like the one involved in this case, is actually considered by those who are experts in firearms as a piece of junk. Isn't that true? I would think so. Thank you. That piece of junk that we just looked at cost about $21, isn't that right, sir? I really don't know, sir. And um, so far as you're concerned at the time, that gun that you saw in the stacks was a Mauser, isn't that right? At that, that point, at that point in time, yes, sir. And it wasn't until after a certain gun in the possession of the FBI suddenly turned out to be a man licker that it changed from being a Mauser to a man licker. Isn't that true? I would say that's accurate statement. Yes, yes thank sir. you. And isn't it true that you, Officer Boone, were never later able to identify the rifle that you found at the Texas School Book Depository as the one that was later shown to you as being the gun involved in this assassination. Isn't that true? That's correct. Now, you say you went to the railroads and did some searching there? Yes, sir. And uh, you went to the Grassy Knoll? Yes, sir. And uh, you went there because there were many, many people told you that they heard shots from that direction. Isn't that right? There were several people, yes, sir. And you knew that a lot of people ran in that direction, didn't you? No, sir. Do you have, could we have the clip, please, of the film? The Hughes film?
You see people running toward the grassy knoll, sir? Yes. There were scores of them, were there not? Yes, running in the direction of the grassy knoll, that's correct. Also in the direction of the, the assassination scene. Now, you said you checked the area of the grassy knoll for powder burns? Yeah, we checked the foliage, yes, sir. For in powder fire, burns? For powder burns? burns? How did yes, you check sir. it? Visually? Yes, sir. Well, did you find any? No, sir. Do you think you would have been able to recognize powder burns in the foliage if you had seen it? I believe so, sir. Did you find any powder burns up in the sixth floor of the Texas Book Depository? I did not. Did you know of anybody in the history of the world who found any powder burns up there? Not to my knowledge, no, thank sir. Thank you, sir. Judge, thank you very much. Thank you, officer. I appreciate your testimony. Yes, sir. I have no further questions. Thank you. Leader Eck, very briefly, Your Honor. Mr. Boone, did the FBI ever show you a rifle which they said was a rifle found on the sixth floor? Yes, sir. And what did you say when you looked at that rifle? It appears to be the rifle that I saw on the sixth floor of the school book repository. Well, didn't you just tell Mr. Spence that uh, you could not identify it? I could not identify it positively because I did not have an identifying mark on the weapon. Okay, but it appeared to be the same it weapon. It appeared to be the same That's weapon. Good Thank you. No further questions. Did it appear to be a man liquor? Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. That's you may it. step down. Thank you very much, Mr. Boone. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to help us produce more compelling historical content like this, Please like, comment below, and share this video with fellow history buffs. And of course, be sure to subscribe to help keep history happening.